Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Joining me today on the Active Advisor Podcast is my fellow colleague and co-host, Dale Corman, CFP, CIMA. Dale is an investment consultant at Harbor covering the Southeast region of the United States. Thank you for joining me today, Dale. Absolutely. Our guest for today's podcast is Frank Toth. Frank is the Principal and Chief Operating Officer at the Boca Raton-based Capital Conclusions Corporation, where he has worked for nearly 20 years now after beginning his career at Merrill Lynch in the year 2000. Good time to start, Frank. Frank specializes in areas of investment analysis, risk management, fixed income and equity trading, tax reduction strategies, insurance and asset protection, financial and estate planning. Frank, how are you doing today? I'm great. That's a mouthful. (laughs) It is. And that was a challenging year to begin your time in the business. Yes, it certainly was. But they often say, you know, the most challenging time is a period where you learn the most. And I'm a big fan of that. So. Yep. Very true. So usually we begin with a hook that we all have something in common to. How did you begin? What's your first memory relating to money or investing? Yeah. So I guess it really started when I was young. My dad and my grandfather used to sit around a lot and talk about stocks and investing. And there was a show that came on and I think it was PBS TV. It was like the Louis Rukeyser report back in the early 80s. And I was always intrigued because he'd come on, he'd start talking about stocks, he'd seen all these green lines on TV and talking about money and people making money. It always intrigued me. So I used to sit when I was little in front of the TV and sort of watch this because my father and my grandfather would talk about it. And I tried to get involved in the conversations. And I guess that's really the first memory I have. And that sort of gravitated towards sitting with my grandfather and my dad because, well, I call it the old days. I mean, there's people older than me, but my father was an architect and they had this sort of graph paper. I don't know, there's a technical term for it. I can't remember, but he used to go out and he'd write down the stocks on this paper and he'd write how much the stock was worth and whether it went up or went down that day. And he used to sit down and show me what he was doing. And, you know, I guess from that point, you know, became more and more intrigued. And from there, I really developed an interest in it. Awesome. It's a great story. That sounds like a great way to gain interest in the profession. So you began your career in the wirehouse firm. What did you learn in those early years that you still think about or are applying to your practice now, 20 some odd years later? I've always been a big proponent of trying to, and maybe it's the analytical side of me, just learning everything I can about whatever I'm doing, right? So I think the step when I wound up getting a position in Merrill, it was really important for me to start at the bottom and work my way up. And one of the crucial things I found is from an operational standpoint, I needed to learn, you know, how is this business run and what are all the components that go into it from the bottom? Because I figured, you know, one day if this was a career, which, you know, I certainly wanted to move forward with, then I needed to know, okay, how did XYZ work and operations are, you know, primary function of how business runs. So that's sort of my role when I stepped in at Merrill was from the operational side. And then from there, I work with some advisors and learning more than on the financial side, but I would say I spent a couple of years on the operational side and gained a ton of knowledge. As did I. It's a great way to learn the business from the bottom up. Yep, correct. You took that kind of operational experience and working with the advisors, you left eventually the wirehouse environment for a little bit more independence. If you wouldn't mind talking through some of the thoughts, I guess, that led up to that move. Yeah, of course. So, you know, it was an interesting time. We started off saying, you know, 2000 and when I stepped in and sometimes I feel like I'm part of this lost generation, right? Because I started in the late nineties where the tech bubble we had, and, you know, we went through this major crash in 2000 and then we came along to, you know, 9-11 and so on and so forth and 08 crash. And, and we can go on and on, you know, a little bit later, but I was feeling like I was being constricted, you know, working in a box. And my approach was always more of a top-down approach. It's even our management style, you know, looking at the overall macro. And my feeling was, is if I'm working with a client, I don't want to be constrained. If your primary service is X, there's all this other stuff that's on the table. And there's all this other stuff that you can use to bring value to a client. Because in my opinion, there's loyalty and value. And I understood that from very early on, right? And I knew that if I can sort of build a model that was more client-centric, versus something that was more product centric. And this is going back to 2000 as we're going through Merrill and as to why I decided to leave, I felt that I could build a better platform. More importantly though, I wanted to do it differently. 
I saw the needs of clients much more than just asset management. We're talking about estate planning, taxation, insurance needs, so on and so forth. And we can get into that later, but that was really the key reason why I decided to say, hey, you know what? I'm young. I'm going to try and go for it. We all take risks. I had a baby that was going to be born in two months. I just bought a place in Boca and I was basically saying, hey, I'm resigning and I'm starting at zero. And that was scary, but yeah, you got to do that stuff. Agreed. That's great. So Frank, I wanted to kind of dig into that a bit and hit the other side of that. So as long as I've known you, it's only been on the independent side. I guess if you can think back to the early years going independent, what were some of those challenges kind of breaking away from the structure of the wirehouse side? And I guess over the nearly 20 years, ever have any second thoughts or kind of have a desire to go back to having more structure? What do you think? Yeah. So a number of challenges, right? And when you leave that corporate structure and go on the path of entrepreneurship, you've got to create your own structure. So one of the things I was also pretty good at was cross-marketing. And you know, back in the day, there were sorts of all these goals at Merrill you had to reach and a certain amount of assets, a certain amount of productions. But I knew that, okay, I didn't have any relationships. I literally was the guy making 350 calls a day. I was walking the neighborhoods and I said, you know what? We have to think smarter, right? We always have to think smarter. You can work harder, but it's also better if you think smart and combine that with working harder. So I did a lot of cross-marketing and I knew that if I started working and partnering with other advisors and working assets on their book, you know, people that they would not normally speak with, I knew that maybe potentially that could bring me to where I needed to be. So with that mentality, one of the things that I did was when I left, And I really don't look back because I sort of applied that same process to the independent side. Right. And fortunately, at the time I was married, I had my father-in-law was an estate planning attorney and I had a long conversation with him and I propositioned and said, listen, if you'll allow me to market and create a seminar and educate people on what we do, but more so this was going back to 04 on the economy. Because I always feel that you're an educator, right? We always talk about sales. We're really educators. And I really think that that's the path forward. So taking that route, it was challenging and it was a lot of work, but it always goes back to providing that value. And in order to provide the value, you provide the education. So yeah, I really started delving into their book of business. You know, and there's a attorney client privilege, but I wound up again, cold calling and setting up seminars. And that's sort of how it all started and providing an educational seminar. And through that, We started developing relationships, and that's where the business actually began. Wow. No, it's great. If you wouldn't mind, take a minute and kind of characterize the path so far for Capital Conclusion Book of Business. Okay. You know, has it been a relatively smooth transition? It sounds like you've worked out in your brain kind of how you wanted the path to go. Obviously, there's always a few hiccups along the way, but was there a big inflection point in the firm? Was there a period of time in the markets that really helped you get to that sustainable level and get a big book? For us, it was a slow grind. My partner, who was very fortunate to meet when I left Merrill, we actually call him the rocket scientist. He actually is an engineer and some of his stuff is on the moon with the first lunar excursion module. So I have to certainly give him praise and and a plug. And he was really instrumental in helping me make the decision and partner to start Capital Conclusions. And like I said, a slow grind, you know, it took a lot of time to develop relationships Mm -hmm. And certainly through these meetings, set up further client meetings in order to really show how we were different. In conjunction to that, you know, going back to the cross-marketing, I always knew that, and over time, figured just through experience, is that the other trusted advisor is a client CPA. So for us, I thought it was not only lucrative, but extremely beneficial from a client's perspective to really partner with client CPAs. Because if you can get the trust and loyalty from the CPA, I'm a firm believer in always go back to providing that value. You know, don't work in a vacuum, work with a team approach, right? And it's always better. And if you can show that client CPA on some inner workings of, okay, this is how we operate. This is how we're looking to save taxes. You know, this is some of the things that we're thinking about. You will really gain a great level of trust. And through that, and over time, we developed more CPA relationships so, you know, it wasn't an immediate, hey, you know, all of a sudden we went from X amount and grew three, four, five X. It was through time, you know, with some setbacks along the way, certainly in 08. However, more recently, we did get to a point where we acquired a practice, look a business. 
And that propelled us over a certain hurdle that now we are looking to potentially bring someone else on board. Nice. And I guess this kind of delves into a little bit of kind of behavioral finance as well. But is there a typical client at Capital Conclusions or is your base kind of because you have that servicing approach, is everything really diverse and you're able to have a wide array? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's funny being in Boca Raton, certainly you have (laughs) All jokes aside, we get it. All jokes aside, right? But look, I mean, retirees obviously was, and I believe still is our largest, you know, you say, hey, what clientele do you have in your book represents, you know, 60, 70, I would say retirees, right? So your typical 50, 60, 70 year olds, actually even people approaching retirement. It's a bit diverse because I would say over the last maybe five years or so, we've been adding clients, business owners, you know, we've seen this huge spike in entrepreneurs and people starting their own businesses over the last, you know, three, four years. So we're getting a number of people that are in their earlier 30s and 40s. Matter of fact, we do quite a bit. My partner had some relationships with some sports personalities, got some athletes. So that's another piece of our practice as well. But yeah, I couldn't nail it down and say, hey, you know, we're specifically X type of people. We also have some business owners as well. So I would say we are pretty diverse, but more concentration in retirees. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, given the demographic and given your location. So Frank, obviously I've known you for a long time now. And for me, it's been fun to watch your firm grow and evolve. And like you said, kind of diversify a bit. I want to dig a little bit deeper. So as you look forward, call it five years, you know, what are some of your firm goals over the next five years? You talked about the book that you recently acquired, which is great and very exciting. What else is on the horizon? Are you looking to build out staff, acquire other books, grow organically? Can you talk to us about that? You know, it's really a combination of both. You know, I'm in my 40s, so I've got longer time ahead of me. My partner's like, I call him the Warren Buffett as well. I mean, he's in his 70s. God bless the guy is going to work until his 90s. I hope so. He's been really instrumental on the insurance side of our business. But yeah, I mean, we would like to continue to grow. We're taking on new clients. We're looking at potentially acquiring another small book of business, preliminary talks. We'll see where that goes. And yeah, of course, with that comes adding team members. So I think for us, it's really even along those routes, but you've got this influx of people moving here. I mean, it's all over the news. You you can't miss it. And one of the things I think is crucial for people in our business and part of, you know, to attach, you know, or complement this growth process is branding yourself. You know, I think it's something that no one really talks about, right? Like, you know, we we have all the big names, but the independent guys, I mean, we got to brand ourselves. And one of the ways we do that, I really spent the last year in really developing brand and developing website content, which, you know, maybe we'll get into in a little bit, but I think that's a really a great driver because, you know, people come down here and the first thing they do, I mean, certainly is relations, but they go on the computer and they're going to Google advisor, they're going to Google wealth management services. So you've got to be able to capture that attention. I'm a big proponent of human behavior, attention, and again, trying to use any and all means to capture what you can. So with that sort of process in play, I'm hopeful that, and again, it's a process. It takes time. Nothing's immediate. I'm hopeful that that will help also propel us and then be able to, yes, keep growing. Right now, we're looking at one individual. We need to bring on two. That's a great problem. So going out five years, I mean, yes, substantially grow more. And again, maybe look at acquiring another practice. What are your thoughts around scale versus capacity? And is your decision to kind of leverage IFP's broker-dealer platform a part of that? Yeah. The ceiling and the limitation is, right, we're still a small office. And yes, IFP, we've partnered with them through their asset management platform. And there are a number of services that we're now looking into in order to leverage certainly what we're doing in order to getting us to that next level. So There are several pieces of the pie. I think that, you know, we're also trying to be mindful of certainly what's happening now with the economy. And unfortunately, with the amount of layoffs that could be forthcoming, you know, maybe that will provide us with even a larger talent pool that we can pick from. So it will be a combination of both. And IFP continues to grow. They're also expanding their support staff. So we've been leaning on them a little bit more as of late, and we see that path continuing. Nice. So now we're going to turn over to a little bit more of a personal question. What are two or three of your go-to resources for staying on top of the markets? Is it media? Is it you're reading blogs, your own organization? Yeah. So I read a lot and I've always been passionate about finance. So for me, it's pleasurable. You know, often people are like, oh, well, what's the latest book you've read? And I go, well, 
I really don't. I'm really not a book guy. I never really have been a book guy. I tend to seek other areas of getting information, especially now. So yeah, there's a lot of people that I follow for quite a while, people that I've got relationships with, you know, on the private equity side, institutionally, through conversations of people for years that I've followed, and then just doing my own due diligence and reviewing, you know, you know through Twitter is a great median, but you can get a ton of information. So yeah, I tend to stay away from the traditional media sources. As a matter of fact, I really don't even watch TV. Most of my news comes from various sources, which can all be brought up online. Nice. What about the practice of staying up to date on what's happening in the market landscape? Obviously, through those various sources you just mentioned. Do you have any organizing principles to your schedule, dedicated time during the day? Have you found you were able to set aside 10 to 15 minutes, or maybe it's a half hour? Is that something you have incorporated into your practice and your routine? Yeah, it goes back to the old time blocking. I mean, we all work a schedule that's comfortable for us. I've seen a lot of people, okay, you know, this is the time you should do X, Y, Z. I sort of say, you know what? You've got to do what works for you, all right? You've got to sort of find that balance. For me, most of that research is done in the evenings. I'm sitting around, you know, at late at night, and instead of popping on Netflix, I'll just start reading information, you know, financial information. I'll just start combing the blogs and seeing what's out there. So, you know, I do have some periods during the day where I'll say, okay, I sort of set aside no more than maybe a half hour or 45 minutes to just stay current. And again, it's through even stuff like Bloomberg or Reuters, you know, where I have subscriptions. So that keeps me up to date and abreast of what's going on. But I wouldn't say there's a specific time block where I say, okay, from 10 to 11, I do this. No, I don't run that way. So Frank, let's dig a little bit deeper and how that relates to social media. And I like to joke that you're the hardest working man in show business when it comes to social media. You see you on you know on LinkedIn and on Instagram. Yes. Yeah, a lot of really good, thoughtful, and in some cases, delicious content. And we'll get into that Thank in you. a bit. That's a bit of a teaser. How do you keep up with that content to the point you made earlier? And how do you decide what's the best to post versus just what you're taking in for your own research? Yeah, so interesting point. What's the best to post? So everyone sort of has this mentality of like, oh, okay, let me think. And you know what? It's funny. So I became a big proponent of, you know, give a shout out to Gary V. Yeah, I'm sure maybe some people heard of him. Yeah. And where I really got on the bandwagon the last couple of years when we had Corona, we were at home. And when I started to put together all this branding strategy and really got into the marketing side of things, because we really didn't have presence. And, you know, I go back to my point on branding. It's imperative. And I think it's so overlooked, especially you don't even hear anyone in our field talking about it. So with what you said, you know, how do you think? So I do and I don't. A lot of times I'll just throw stuff out there. And it's funny because a number of times it's just repositioning content. And that's, you know, not to give it away. Of course, I do come up with a number of things, but I'm no genius. I was a B student in school. You know, I'm more of a street guy than anything else. I mean, I would say, you know, I think my GPA when I graduated was like 2.9 or 3.0. I am in by no means the brains here. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's an old quote. It says, obsession beats talent all day long. So I became obsessed with something, right? Yeah. And the obsession is put out content, put out content, put out content. And whether you're repositioning it, whether you're coming up with your own, it's just the fact that you're getting it out. Because by you getting it out, you're providing value. And I'm not shy on saying, you know, what my feelings are in the market. And I'm not always right. I mean, no one has a crystal ball. What I do feel strongly about is educating people, educating clients, and putting enough content out there that at least it's meaningful enough so that people say, hey, you know what? I never thought about that. Maybe I should go take a look at that. And eventually that will drive business. I mean, the ROI in that is (laughs) XXX. Eventually, it's what we hope. But that's not what you think now. You just have to go through the process. I'm a big proponent of that because it's not a short game. We're in this for a long time. Right. Makes sense. Lead with value first. Correct. Correct. Is there anything in the DNA of your investment philosophy that you consider the firm's investment edge without going into specifics on any particular products? What are some of the characteristics in a fund or an ETF that captures your attention or on behalf of your clients? Maybe it's the process, you know, when we talk about attracting clients and our investment process is one piece, but I think it's really the initial process that's so important because we really don't get into the investment process much because it's so technical, right? And clients are simple. They don't need technical. Certainly if they want to learn, we're totally happy to go through those pieces. But 
you know, in attracting clients, I think it comes down to our process. And we've got a very unique process. We actually created our own retirement planning software. It's really a reverse engineered the retirement planner from a cash flow perspective. Basically, my partner and I sat down back in 07 and we said, look, there's something missing from the marketplace. And I'm a big fan of, okay, let's put everyone through the same. It has to be efficient, right? In any sort of practice, we have to have efficiency. And how do we get efficiency? We have to have a really good process and sort of put everyone through that process. So we decided to create this sort of planner. And it's really, gosh, I mean, it's it's at the core of our business. And it's used in conjunction with going through a client's overall expenses, but it's more from a holistic approach. So we're just not looking at, okay, you know, the market's X, Y, Z, you are 60, 40. I mean, you throw all that out the window. We're not back, you know, 10 years ago. People have to understand that everything's changed. And this is a very client-centric approach that's built upon several principles and putting the client through a very strict process because the output from that Obviously, then comes the design of the portfolio mm-hmm. and what approach we go through in diversifying those clients' assets. So, yeah, you know, everyone has sort of their own blueprint. And that's not to say that, you know, when we look at developing a portfolio, the resources we pull from and the parties that we use, you know, across the board, for instance, if we like, you know, a certain area of equities or certain fixed income and a particular manager. You know, that'll obviously apply to several clients. And again, depending upon X, Y, Z variables, but yes, you know, it, it's all about the process and not getting so crazy about, you know, the alpha or beta of a portfolio. I like it. Clearly ETFs are exploding in popularity and asset growth the last few years. I know you are an early adopter to the ETF products that may not have a 10 year track record, but you dig into the people, philosophy and approach. How do you research specifically and get comfortable with a new ETF? It's a great question. And I know I'm an early adopter to a number of things, but not across the board. I'm a real big proponent of learning about the culture and the experience, right? I mean, I get calls all the time for people that have, you know, 30 million in a new fund, 25 million, and, you know, they want us to take a look at it. I need a lot more than that, right? I need to sit down or I need to have conversations with the people really running the money because I'm a real big proponent of emotional intelligence. I feel that that's often a very overlooked thing in our industry. And everyone goes by, okay, well, how smart are you? And getting all the numbers is great. But, you know, emotional intelligence is a whole other side of things. And I think it's also crucial when we talk about investing and we talk about clients and achieving goals and, and how we operate. So, From a due diligence perspective, we want to make sure that, you know, have you been through an 08? Have you been through an 07? How the asset class? I mean, there's a number of factors that go into the list of questions when I vet someone and when I go through that process. So there's a lot of thinking behind it. And again, my feeling is, is that if I have enough, if there's enough conviction and I'm always trying to find something that's different and not saying from a contrarian standpoint, but, you know, there's often times where the right thing comes at always the wrong time. So you always you know, have to think outside the box and specifically certain asset classes, this is how they work, perform differently during different economic cycles. And it, it goes back to you know the foundation of economics. If you understand how some of these things work, then you can apply that knowledge in going through your due diligence and deciding, hey, do I want to work with this company? Do they have something that I think is different and that could add value to the bottom line? You know, whether that's through non-correlation, diversification, risk management. So we always have that risk management mindset. Okay, it's great. We can all make money in great times. What if stuff blows up? You know, what if we have a crappy day? What if we have a crappy next few years, which that's a whole other conversation. You know, we've already entered a different cycle in this market. You know, I want to see how are we going to perform? What are the pitfalls? Let's go through some of those things. So, you know, I try and do enough of that to protect our clients and also to make for a good experience. That's great. It sounds like you subscribe to the old adage, you know, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, <laughs> go back to rule number one, right? Yeah. It's a, <laughs> right. <laughs> well said. And look, we're going to make money and we're going to lose money. Okay. We just don't want to lose a lot of money. I mean, that's right. the thing, right? We want to have a degree of protection. Certainly we've been in this business long enough. We can put our hats together and say, okay, how can we help protect some of that downside risk? Sure. 
You talked, Frank, about some of the things that you look for in a, whether it's a new investment strategy or if you're bolting on something to an existing portfolio, what are one or two red flags maybe that you've seen that you may be impressed with what you're seeing so far? And if one or two of these things pop up, you're out. That's a really a great question. Part of what I believe is, is that what you're told when you initially start reviewing something new is not how it works. And that's no fault to the individual. It's just from a lack of experience. So there are often some red flags come in is when you start to do a little deep dive into mm -hmm. a number of factors and see exactly, okay, for instance, if you know something's so wonderful and paying 10%, well, if this was you know a year ago in a 1% interest rate environment, well, we're, we're taking on some risk to get that 10% or 8%, <laughs> right? So right. we have to break down, okay, well, how are we getting there? Explain that to me. And oftentimes, if it can't be explained, that's a red flag. So yeah, it goes back into being inquisitive, asking questions, getting into the muck of the design. And then, you know, oftentimes that stuff will come up to the surface if you ask the right question. That's an operations background coming through. There you go. That's, <laughs> the, that's right. You hit it on the head. What role does investment acumen and original bespoke investment management play in how you tell the story of your firm? Is it this part of the package that gets the client to make the decision to work with you, or is it another part of the practice? So it's part of it. We obviously have our own way of doing things as far as you know managing our assets. And you know, as our business grows, we're looking to you know, partner up with IFP and looking at some other alternatives. But you know, it's part of our design that we put and the design of our entire client-centric, I call it, you know, holistic financial planning process. And that's a piece of it. But the other part of that design, it's compassion for the client. I mean, it's going back to actively listening, which a lot of people don't get because they're so busy on talking. When you actively listen to a client, that is going to set you worlds apart from anyone else because it's your total desire to understand their vulnerabilities and to serve the emotional needs. Because the emotional need, you know, investment decisions, I mean, God, it's just like 80% emotional, right? I mean, yeah, there's technical going to it, but we all know it's emotions that drive everything. It's even hard for ourselves not having our emotions come into play. So we have our own ideas on structuring a portfolio dependent upon what economic cycle that we are in. But the design and going through that process and having that emotional intelligence, that understanding, as I understand a client, and then customizing a proprietary design and engineered approach to sort mm -hmm. of this financial planning process is really crucial. So it's interesting because so many people delve into the, okay, this is what we need. This is your asset mix. My question is, how are your assets titled? Because if you have an account in your name and God forbid you get hit by a bus or something happens to you, guess what? You could have a probate issue. Did you know that? And the, the answer is, well, I'll just have my son in the account. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now you've just opened yourself up to an additional creditor. So my background, you know, we go back to, right, analytical, learning, learning, estate planning, taxation. You know, I've taught myself for years. I actually was one step away from taking the CFP. My son was born. I was actually ready to sit for the exam as I did all the coursework and it passed all the pieces. And Unfortunately, you know, during that time, it put off and things got so busy, I never went back to it. But I always had the mindset of looking at all these pieces and applying it. You know, we say you, as far as your bespoke you know, model, and this is really the entire process is going through all of these pieces because it's that, you know, holistic view of a client's individual picture that you have to pay attention to. The investment piece will fall. And of course, that's extremely important, but we've got to line everything else up first. So we're going to shift gears. What is one consensus view or portfolio allocation decision that you see widely held or talked about in the investment media, whatever the media may be, that you yeah. disagree with? <laughs> Some examples we've had are international equities, commodities, emerging markets. Well, I mean, it was the 60-40. It was like, oh, well, you know, have a 60-40 or most people were like, just buy the S&P 500, right? It always goes up. Like, no, markets aren't efficient <laughs> if they always go up. It goes down too, right? And people are getting that, you know, which is why I've always been such a proponent of, okay, look, you just can't buy and hold. Investing is, in my opinion, dynamic, right? So things will always change. You have to be fluid. You have to be tactical. I've always been a fan of active management. You know, yes, is there a piece for passive? Obviously, it always comes down to the clientele, but 
we are in a different market as we once were for the last 20 years. Okay. Money isn't cheap anymore. And that's going to change a number of things, which I really don't think a lot of people understand. So in understanding that, you have to be able to spot opportunities when they're present. So the consensus of, hey, own the 60, 40, 40, it doesn't, in my opinion, it just doesn't work anymore because things are changing. It used to work, right? We used to say, well, look at history. History repeats, it often rhymes, yes and no. But you also have to look, at, you can't just say this happened years ago and hey, look, the S&P's average eight, eight, nine. Well, it could average 5% over the next five years. I don't know. No one can tell you what it can do. So with understanding that, you really have to be mindful of how things can change over time and how you need to adapt to stay up with that. Yeah, that makes sense. So you talked about this a bit earlier, Frank, you know, about the emotional side of things and kind of that EQ. So we all know that there's definitely a human element of investing, and it's probably an underappreciated one. So returns are about more than, you know, sharp and beta and ratios, right? Right. So I know you call yourself a quote unquote financial therapist, right? (laughs) What does that look like in practice? And I guess as a follow-up, do you charge extra for that or is that included? Oh, no. There was a quote I read. It was helping one person might not change the world, but it may change the world for that one person. And that's sort of the mentality approach is that I thoroughly enjoy helping people. It's what I've always done all my life. And it comes from my background going through my life. I've had a lot of people close to me that I've lost over the years at really young ages. So I'm an oversensitive guy. And maybe that plays into it. Where the therapy comes in is I really feel the need for, you know, people want to express themselves and they want to be heard. And that's important. And, you know, when I talk about active listening, you know, our job is to listen to the client. It all goes into the emotional, the compassionate side. You want to understand this person? Well, you want to listen to what they have to say, but you also have to ask the right questions. So the therapy comes in is, yeah, it is really therapy because it's therapeutic for a client because, you know, we are in such an intimate business, which I don't think people realize. I know everything about my client. I know more things about my client than their own children, but that's crucial because if I don't ask the right questions, I cannot help them, you know, deep, deep, deep down for what they need. And I have, you know, I have tissues in my drawer. I've got like boxes of tissue because I can tell you how many times clients have cried in my office and, you know, it becomes a very emotional environment. And I think that not everyone is cut out for that, but I believe that it's crucial in understanding the client emotionally because you will learn a ton and that will help you, I mean, you partner with them and that's our job and that will help them through the process because then you can really lead them towards a path of more financial independence with a level of emotional comfort. That's crucial. I'm I'm speechless. No, I like it. No, thank you so much. That's how we've operated. That's part of the reasons why I wanted to build something different because the emotional piece really runs everything, right? It runs all our lives. It doesn't yeah. matter what we do, whether we're in our own work or we're building our own businesses or taking care of our families, emotions is everything. No, and I think in a business where we've seen a lot of the major players try to go more formulaic, robotic, for lack of a better word, you know, solutions towards people, this is definitely, I think people do forget that this is a client service and client driven business. And so we are there to help them out on this journey called life, where we all end up at the same place. Yep. And you know what? AI is supposed to complement that. You know, the question often comes up, oh, well, you know, AI is going to put you out. And I I laugh. (laughs) Like, it's not true because humans connect, right? It's human connection. AI can't replace human connection. Now, they can develop emotional in AI and, you know, God knows how many years. I don't ever think that'll happen because remember, human input is needed for AI. You know, humans will always gravitate towards other humans. And you have to look at AI to complement your business. You always have to lean in to the technologies because they're there and they're going to continue to grow. It's going to be one of the fastest growing segments, probably just like the internet was. And then we saw the iPhone. I believe that AI will be that next growth segment. And we're in the infancy stages. And there's going to be a lot of things that we go through. But this will be the next big move, I believe. But we have to figure out how do we lean into it? How does it complement us so that it could get us to that next level? 
Agreed. So I understand you're a connector of people, kind of working that connection phrase in a different way. Tell me more about that and how it's benefited you, your practice, and others. Sure. Well, they often say, and I'll probably steal this from Gary V's quote, kindness is the ultimate strength. You know, it's the soft skills. You know, how do we connect with people? Be nice. Doesn't <laughs> cost you anything. Just be nice. And it's amazing yeah. the ROI on being nice. You can't even put a dollar figure on it, but people forget. You know, someone has a chip on the shoulder, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Be kind and be nice. So yes, I try and network with people. I try and listen to them. I try and hear them out. And I try and offer solutions and be helpful for people. You know, I've met people through LinkedIn. I've networked through my clients. And again, it's just connecting with other people because it goes back to people need people. And that's sort of how this world works. And, you know, if you get that, it's very easy. You know, we, we all just have to, and I understand that sometimes you can be a little timid or, you know, trying to get out of your comfort zone, but you have to use the mindset. We're all in the same position, even hopping on the podcast today. I'm sure we're all a little nervous, whether it goes right, is it filmed properly? Can I be, you know, we all have that little sense of, you know, oh my gosh, this is going to work out great. So yes, but you know, you just have to go for it. That's my opinion. And it's funny. I used to be probably the most introverted person ever. You probably take a step back and say, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean? When I was young, I was extremely introverted. And I think when I landed my position working for Merrill through a cold call, working for the Alumni Association when I was in college, that was sort of my break. It proved to me and my defining moment where I was like, wow, I go, you know, I've been doing this so long. Let me try this. <laughs> then that's how it goes. Yeah. That's great. So speaking of people, like Brian and me, you also have three children. I wouldn't call those young people or small people. I know your oldest towers over you, right? <laughs> yeah, he does. So we want to get to know Frank personally a little bit. So tell us about the kiddos and have any of the three of them express any interest in joining either you or just the industry in general? So no, I tell them to stay out. <laughs> <laughs> I am like, do something else. It's not the way it used to be. No, <laughs> yeah. So I have three children, my son, and real proud of him. He just landed a paid internship, youngest ever get hired at a major cybersecurity firm here in Boca Raton. That's great. You know, my daughter's in a pre-med program. She's 16. My son's going to be 19. I've got an 11-year-old who just is crazy about art. She makes me watch Bob Ross. So I just bought her the kit the other day. She's the painting and drawing. And I mean, and that's huge, right? So you got to whatever it is. And then we're parents, you know, know this, support your kids. And I oftentimes think that we want our kids to, we force them into what we want to do, you know, support what they want to do. And that's the biggest. I know I already get parents. I know this is a parenting podcast, but you know, <laughs> look, I, I've been there and I can only speak from experience. Anything that I've done, then I can help, you know, provide some insight. But none of them, fortunately or unfortunately, have expressed an interest in doing what I do, although my son is coming around. I mean, he has an interest in, you know, first it was crypto and that's a whole other kind. We won't even go there, but we've talked about it and I've shared what I do and he's had some interest. But right now his mindset is, hey, you know, he's all about cybersecurity. So I'm a big fan. Well, that's great. And this is the life podcast, right? I mean, because that's what part of our job is. Yeah, well, that's right. Very true. Yeah. So we're going to transition this back to the business here, kind of back to mentoring advisors. What is the skill that you believe an advisor starting out on the process or journey today should focus on developing? Communication. So not via text? You mean no, actually like looking, no, right? No, talk to people. <laughs> Just talk to people. Communicate. Yeah, I think a lot of people, we hide behind things, right? It's our nature. We're so, you know, you're point, you know, don't text. Yeah, of course, it's easy, right? But you got to be able to communicate. You have to be able to communicate why you and how you're different, right? And so, you know, people that are starting out, I think it's great for them to find a mentor, find a coach. And there are people, even like myself, that, yeah, we'll help you. We're not going to charge you. You know, I know people that have these coaching programs and, you know, they pay so much money. And look, I understand there's a place for everything, but there's so much information, whether it's online or people in the business. I always just say, just ask. People are afraid to ask. You don't ask, you don't receive, right? Find a mentor, learn everything you can. I don't care if you pull up YouTube videos on classes at Yale on collateralized mortgage obligations. I mean, <laughs> the yield curve, learn, 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 learn. You know, put the time in, put the hours in. It's a heck of a lot easier now than it used to be years ago because the information is at our fingertips. So, you know, you can literally learn anything, but 
you need real life experience. So yes, you can learn, but you want to go out there and be a mentor to someone and go through that real life experience. So that would really be the best place to start. Excellent. It's definitely, you know, when you've developed how your perception and how to work in this business, and it's something obviously we all work on and refine every day and, and try to add to, but I think you really do learn something by mentoring and teaching somebody else as well. Yes, it's a two-way street. You do, because I've learned a number of things from some younger individuals where I've been asked to help. And yeah, it doesn't matter what age. I mean, that's part of life. Just continue to learn. I mean, if that goes away, then <laughs> forget it. So we here at Harbor believe wholeheartedly in active management, but every financial professional has their own take. What's your philosophy and where does active management matter most to you? Yes, I'm a big proponent of active management because of the environment that we're in, but also because it allows you to find opportunities. It allows you to be dynamic and fluid and being able to move around. And the thing today isn't going to be the thing that works out, you know, over the next five years. It's just not. Things change. You know, we talked a little bit about international and go into, well, where is there real value in the market? And it's hard to find right now. You have to be active in order to take advantage of those things. I mean, if you just set it and forget it, then you're going to miss a ton of opportunities. You're not going to be aligned with being able to provide risk-adjusted returns or enhance risk-adjusted returns. Yeah. Very true. So coming to the conclusion here, how can people find you? Social media, your website. Dale's told me about your cooking one too. So please include that. Don't leave us out. You can even start with the cooking one. How about that? Yes. You know, when I was going through Corona, I, I've always had a passion for cooking. So beside Louis Rukeyser, I used to watch Julia Child and I can't think of his name. He was a French chef on TV. I don't know if they came back to back. No, one was on like Saturday morning. I don't know. Call me weird, whatever. But I always love cooking because I'm a foodie, right? So, you know, I watched the show and I used to dabble in the kitchen and mess around with spices and stuff. Where did it lead to? Well, in college, it was funny. All my roommates used to have me cook. So I tell them, fine, I'll cook, but you buy the food. So that was great because it helps yeah. my rent, right? <laughs> Definitely. I was living off campus. You know, long story short, my kids were like, dad, why don't you start an Instagram and, you know, start putting your food up there. Maybe you can take it somewhere. It's like an outlet. And for me, you know, I love, it comes, I guess, with the point of helping people, like nourishing people. It's, that's part of food, right? If you love to cook, you really love to nourish people because you get a great satisfaction out of that. So yeah, I started on Instagram, dad's doing dinner. So that's my official plug. Just did a logo the other day. Started it actually with my brother. My brother and I both got divorced about six years ago, and we wanted to create something that was geared towards dads. Because, you know, I find that oftentimes there's some great dads out there and not that we need recognition, but, you know, the marketplace doesn't really recognize that. There are dads that, yeah, they can cook and that run businesses and they're great fathers and so on and so forth. And it's almost like a hurrah to dads. And that was one of the reasons why I started Dads Doing Dinner. And yes, I love posting my food. You can check it out. It's on Instagram, you know, subscribe. I started making relationships with the Fulton Fish Market in New York with Butcher Box, Grass Fed grass finished organic beef. So I'm starting to do more collaborations with some of these people in just growing and meeting people. And matter of fact, the president of Fulton Fish called me. Hopefully I'm going to get a chance to meet him this summer. So you never know where things take you. Okay. So now that we've wet everybody's appetite, how about the business aspect? Yeah, no, on the business side. So Capital Conclusions, we're on Google. We've got our website up. Again, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So just Google my name, Frank Toth link up with me. You know, I've got a couple thousand people following me, started up about a year and a half ago. And again, I, I just try and put out as much content as possible. So yes, LinkedIn, I'm also on Twitter. And then, you know, dad's doing dinner, certainly from the personal side. Excellent. So before we wrap today, we have a final segment that we're sure you're going to enjoy. It's our 60 seconds or less with Frank where we will be asking quick fire questions on a variety of topics and our guests will only have a minute to respond. Frank has been a great companion. You've been a great, you know, willing victim. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing opportunity. I've loved it. Yeah. Uh, I've been great so far. So sharing your insights and experiences with us. But now it's time for us. Well, Dale, you probably know, but it's now time for myself and the rest of the listening audience to get to know you a little bit better. Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, boy. Here we go. Nickname. Frankie. Hobby. Cooking. Favorite recipe to cook. Bolognese. Best book. Intelligent investor, Benjamin Griff Yeah. 
profession if you weren't an advisor? Chef, possibly, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> bucket list travel destination. Italy for sure, no doubt. Italy. Hidden Ooh. talent. Country singing. Best lunch spot near your office. Abe and Louie's. 6040 portfolio, a classic or a relic? Oh, hell no, relic. <laughs> <laughs> Recession or soft landing? Oh boy. What's worse now? Recession. Yeah, recession. Call, text, or email? Call. Most used emoji in text messaging? Rockstar. What are you optimistic about right now? Life. The Big Short or The Wolf of Wall Street? Oh, The Big Short. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Audiobook, ebook, or physical book? An audiobook. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking time out today, Frank. I know Dale and I have really enjoyed speaking with you, learning a lot more about you. We wish you the best of luck in your journey and uh, educating people about this crazy world we call finance investing. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks. Frank. Likewise. Whether you're a seasoned advisor or just getting started, the Active Advisor brought to you by Harbor Capital offers professional insights for the financial advisor community. Visit us at harborcapital.com to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe to the Active Advisor on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on investment trends, tried and tested research methods, and what your industry peers are up to. From all of us at Harbor Capital, thanks for tuning in. And now for-